Oh my gosh. I don't know if I'm more excited or more nervous to be saying hello to you and welcoming you to episode one of Becoming the Channel, my new podcast. Either way, I want to welcome you. And I'm so glad that you're here with me. I'm Dr. Robin McKay. And I have to tell you, this podcast has been a lifetime in the making. They say that what made you weird as a kid makes you great as an adult. And if that's the case, the reason that I can do this podcast is because I had some, if they weren't weird, they were pretty unusual experiences when I was a kid. You know, I was a clear channel from the time I was small. I just would know stuff or be able to sense things that other people couldn't. And I didn't have a name for it. I certainly didn't call myself a channel back then. I could just tell when Mrs. Hemrick was going to have a pop quiz in third grade math class, or I would walk down the hallway at, in high school to write an essay for a scholarship and have the entire essay download into my system, and I would just write it out and win the scholarship. So I had these unusual experiences that I didn't really describe or talk about to anybody because who are you going to talk to about those experiences in the first place? But in my family, we were all kind of like that. We were all telepathic. We could have entire conversations non-verbally in the car and no one would think twice about it. Somebody would say something aloud and say, well, what about this person? What about Joe? And we would all know who Joe was and what she was thinking about because we'd all been in on the telepathic conversation. But again, we didn't have names for it at that time. I grew up in the 80s and we just did life the best that we could. I was also a STEM girl. I got my first microscope when I was 10 and was profoundly disappointed with the light source, which was a mirror. And um, so really what was cultivated when I was a kid was my science mind, my intellect. So when it came time to graduate from high school and go to college, I went in and I majored in biology, thinking that I would become a Phys uh, physician. But God had other plans. The universe had other plans. And I didn't get into medical school the first time I tried. And I didn't have a mentor to say to me, you know, a lot of people don't get in the first time, go back, do it again. And in fact, I found my way into biotech and pharma and worked as a medical writer and a clinical scientist for about 10 years. And it was during that time that I went through my first Saturn return when I was 28. I didn't know what that was either. I'd never heard of that. All I knew is that sometime around age 28, I found a picture from my high school graduation, you know, the one with the cap and gown. And I looked at that picture and I saw this girl who looked like she had the world by the tail. Her eyes were bright and shiny. She looked excited, like she couldn't wait to get started with life. 10 years later, I was married to my college sweetheart. I was working in the biotech industry, driving 45 minutes one way to work. And I was burned out. I was heavier than I had ever been. And I looked at that picture and I thought, where are you? Because this, what I'm living right now is not what you intended at all. And I felt disappointed in myself in some ways, but in other ways, that moment was very activating for me as well. I found myself wondering if this was all there is. Is this all there is? And I knew inherently that the answer was no. And I wasn't quite sure how to extract myself from this life that I had unconsciously created. In fact, I would come to realize that maybe you can relate to this. I came to realize that I was too well adjusted for my own good. I was smart and I was emotionally intelligent. I was certainly intuitive. And I was intuitive enough to figure out how I needed to shape shift myself or contort myself into other people's expectations, in other people's needs and wants, so that they felt really comfortable. But I, on the other hand, was continuing to sacrifice my own hopes, dreams, and desires on the altar of something I didn't even believe in, and yet just found myself doing sort of out of the patterns that I had been trained into from the time I was a kid. So it was during that Saturn return, right around the age of 28, that I really started asking, what is my purpose? What am I supposed to be doing? And the answers would come to me intuitively. 
they would show up and I would choose and I would move in the direction of those answers, like becoming a mentor for a, a program that mentored young women in STEM programs and finding my way to psychology once again, after having let that go a long time ago. And even in high school, when I started thinking about psychology, I let it go because I didn't think it was aligned with the path that I wanted to take, which was go to go to medical school. But I found my way back to psychology. I found my way back to my intuition. And I found my way out of my marriage. In fact, if you're listening to this on the day that it that it is launched, which is March 16th, 2023, it's exactly 23 years after my marriage ended, my marriage to my college sweetheart. And I remember that day, like it was today, actually, having a big blowout confrontation with my husband and really recognizing in that moment after he left that our marriage was over. It would take another year or so to completely extract myself from it. But it was this day, March 16th, 2000, that I realized that our marriage was over. And I was actually relieved about it because I knew that in that moment that there was a big timeline shift for me, that I was able to actually do what I was meant to be doing in this lifetime, which the good news is that I am doing what I had planned to do all those years ago that I had seen, that I had envisioned. There was a lot of work I had to do between then and now in order to reach this place of being able to sit here with you on at this microphone in this beautiful home that I'm in with my current husband, my, my divine life partner, with our golden doodle puppy and, and have this life that is so good and beyond a lot of what I could have hoped for or imagined. It took a lot. It took 23 years of education, training, healing, transformation, deep, spiritual, physical, emotional, and even cognitive work to get me to this place today. So in some ways, what made me so unique as a kid brought me to that place of having to look at the life I had unconsciously created up until my late 20s. And then it also allowed me to hit reset on my life and to literally jump timelines into the timeline that I'm on now. And certainly there have been other timeline jumps that I've made as well, as I've been constantly course correcting to make sure that I'm staying on course with my true north, with my mission, with my soul's purpose to bring us to this point today where we're, we're here together. So that's my opening salvo for becoming the channel. I want to talk to you a little bit about what this podcast means to me and how I want to be using this to contribute to your life and to the lives of the other people who are in my sphere, in my world. Somebody asked me the other day, how did you make the leap between being a psychologist, which you are, I have a PhD in counseling psychology that I got from the University of Kansas, and I worked early in my career as a psychologist, but I had a colleague say to me one time, he said, you know, if you don't want to be a psychologist anymore, you could sure be a psychic. Well, the truth is, the point that I've already made early on is that I've been intuitive since I was a little kid. I've been a clear channel. I had to really come to terms with that though, because for a lot of my life, I found myself keeping my, my best gifts, the gifts that I came in with, the gifts that I incarnated with, private, behind the scenes. And I dress them up sometimes under the guise of hard work, grit, tenacity, girl next door, I'm just like you. In fact, when I was a kid, I remember wishing, I just want to be like everybody else because inherently I knew that I was quite different from everybody else. And maybe you can relate to that too. There are a group of us who are here on this planet at this time, who are conscious, who are awake, who are aware, who are intelligent, and who actually have the capacity to channel great frequencies of energy, wealth, consciousness, joy. We also have the capacity to channel non-physical beings, those benevolent helpers who are here with us as we walk this ascension path together. 
who were all channeling something. And for a long time, I was channeling the status quo. I was channeling what I believed other people wanted me to be or expected me to be, including becoming a psychologist. One of the ways that I decided that I would get a PhD in psychology was right after I had my awakening back in, back in my 28th year when I went through that whole Saturn return. The spiritual awakening came right after that. And I want to just, as a, even as I say that, I want to say this. I was already awake. I was already intuitive. But I would say that my awakening was more about taking responsibility as an adult for my spiritual experience, for my, for my, I'm looking for the right word here. Give me just a second. For my spiritual beingness for who I actually was, rather than making an apology for who I was. It was that time in my life during my awakening process where I began understanding who I was as a spiritual being, as an awake, wise, ancient being, as a divine being of love, light, and truth, and really using that to drive my life forward. To live my life on purpose required me to take responsibility for my energetic and spiritual gifts for my creations up to date, and to really recognize that I'm not here as a victim, but I am here as a creator, and that it is my responsibility to follow my divine life plan, to follow my soul's purpose and mission, and to do the work I promised to come here to do before I incarnated. That was my awakening. My awakening had to do with the recognition that a lot of the things I had already created, I had done so, albeit unconsciously, but I was still responsible for my creations. I could no longer live with a victim mindset. I had to raise my hand and say, I'm responsible for these creations. I'm responsible for the shit show of the marriage that I had created. I'm responsible for that as a co-creator. That wasn't to blame myself. It was just to raise my hand and take responsibility for my creations. So that was a big part of my early awakening process in my early 30s. The other part of my awakening process, to get back to the point of how I decided to become a psychologist, is I began reading a lot of spiritually informed books about personal development. And I started reading all of these self-help authors like Wayne Dyer and Doreen Virtue and Sonia Choquette. And I looked at their commonalities and I identified with some of their, the words that they used and the lessons that they taught for sure, but I also identified with them as people. And I looked at what their credentials were. Wayne Dyer had a PhD in educational psychology. Dorian Virtue had a PhD in counseling psychology. Sonia Choquette had a PhD in metaphysics. And I remember reading their books early on, this was in the early 2000s, and I thought to myself, well, I know that I'm meant to do what these people are doing, so I must have to get my PhD. And that was kind of the sum total of my decision making about getting my PhD in psychology. I very quickly decided that I was going to get my PhD at the University of Kansas because I lived in Kansas at the time, and I also loved the University of Kansas. I had done my undergrad there as well. And I found this beautiful program, this beautiful counseling psychology program, where I was actually able to be very nurtured in my curiosity and interest in spiritual development, spiritual intelligence, creativity, and intuition. In fact, one of my early articles that I contributed to, which is still an article that is well cited in the academic research, is an article that we wrote on how creative people make decisions about their careers using their intuition, among other things. So it's not too big of a leap when you really look at the granularity of my path, how I could go from being a psychologist to being a channel because I've always been a channel. And the way that it got expressed and articulated earlier in my career happened to be through the lens of counseling psychology. I became a social scientist, but I have to tell you this. I was thinking about this earlier today. Everything that I have created in my life that I hold precious and dear, the best of what I've created in this life has been channeled. 
I can mask it through, yeah, I worked really hard. I gave blood, sweat and tears and all of that whole story, but it's not actually true. Everything that I've created that is good in my life has been channeled. It, I've been in flow, in other words. And maybe you can relate to that too. See, one of the things that I know for sure about people who have the capacity to channel, who are intuitive, who are open, who have a great sense of adventure, who have a, an expansive imagination, who have access to their emotional intelligence so that they can manage their own emotions and the emotions of other people, those kinds of characteristics. The one thing that we become very good at, very adept at, is masking our abilities in order to make things look a little bit harder for other people who aren't quite as clear as we are, who aren't quite as bright as we are. It makes it easier certainly to fit in. It makes it easier to fulfill our wish to just be like everybody else. And in many ways, it's also self-protective to a point. But at some point, the self-protection tips into self-betrayal. Our desire to not rock the boat, to not wait, make waves, to, and yet we question the status quo, and yet we are constantly seeking new ideas and new ways of doing things and asking why and how and what's the best way to. The way that we mask our vast intellect, our vast curiosity, our vast creativity is often through dimming our own light. And one of the things that has come forward in the past few years around the people who I've been working with who are like me in a lot of ways, open, intuitive, smart, educated, curious, spiritually connected, is that we're too well adjusted for our own good. And it's actually in stripping away all of the programs and all of the, the patterns of behaving that make us look like everybody else and really stepping into who we actually are. That is the transformation. That is the journey. And that is the, if you're looking for a reason why an award-winning psychologist is now calling herself a channel and having a podcast calling Becoming the Channel, this is a process of identity development. And it is also a process of verification of who you actually are, who I actually am. A couple of years ago, I had the opportunity to do some work in the corporate space. And this is, this is part of my, my journey is that I have done work in the corporate space for a long, long time. Burnout, recovery, leading through uncertain times as, as our world went through the pandemic and so on. And a lot of times the people who hire me, who ask me to come in are in tech, fintech and healthcare. And so they like me because I'm a psychologist. They like what I have to say and the way that I say things, because I would frame things in, in terms of positive psychology, which is very based in research and science. But I had this occasion to meet with an executive at a leading company with, the, with one of his um, leader, with a member of his leadership team who really wanted me to come in and work with the women, particularly in their in their division. And this executive said to me, he commented that my work was pretty woo woo and that it was a little bit too touchy feely for him. And I had this moment of recognizing something so important here. And that is that I had reached a point where I'd grown weary and even bored of apologizing for or acknowledging that my work is a little woo woo or it's a little too touchy feely. I began to recognize that when somebody says that it just tells me more about who they are and their comfort level with their own emotional intelligence, with their own intuition. And that I was no longer available for working with people who would criticize the 20 years of experience, work, investment in time, energy, effort 
into developing into who I am as a leader, as a healer, as a spiritually intelligent channel. And so that was really a turning point for me. And I'm very grateful for that experience. That's not something that a few years ago, I would have probably been, you know, grumpy and crunchy and how dare he, but I really just I really just said at that point, you know what, I'm no longer available for this. And so that's really when I began to start normalizing our experiences as intuitives, even in the corporate space, because y'all, if you are in the corporate space and you're listening to me and you know me, you're like me, whether or not you choose to bring that forward into your work and to allow people to see the fullness of who you are, that's a choice. And it's a developmental milestone, actually. But if you're here, the likelihood is that you are intuitive, that you do have the capacity to channel high frequencies, that you do have the capacity to bring about innovative transformations in your organization. I really believe that now there's never been a better time than now to come out of the closet as an intuitive in the corporate space or in the business space, wherever you are, because I do know that the intuitives are actually on the leading edge of bringing in this new world that we are journeying toward. So how I made the leap from being a psychologist to a channel, I don't think it's actually a leap, is it? It just is a perspective shift. I've channeled all the time throughout my entire career. In fact, I had a client a while ago who's worked with me for 10 years. I have clients who work with me for a long period of time, not because we're codependent, but because I keep evolving and they keep moving with me. And she said to me, she said, Robin, you've been channeling the whole time. You're just saying it out loud now. And she's very happy for me about that and celebrating who I've shown up as, as I've continued my work, my evolution. And I hope that um, the, it role models something for you as well. I'm a, in human design, I'm a generator, but I'm a three, five generator, which means that I try by experimenting. And a lot of people learn vicariously through me. Like you don't necessarily have to go through all the fires that I've gone through in my life, but certainly you can learn from them. And that's one of the reasons that I want to do this podcast is I want to teach you my perspective, how I see things, how I connect in with my guides and with the universal life force and how I've learned to channel one of the most important of all of the frequencies, wealth consciousness. Those of us who are on the ascension path grab on to our spiritual development and we learn how to meditate and we learn how to get in touch with our emotions and we learn how to heal our, our traumas. We learn how to retrieve our souls, how to break free of the past patternings, how to use energy to create transformation. We learn all of these things in the energetic realm. And the thing that we bypass, the thing that we ignore is our financial, our financial energy, our financial relationships, our relationship with money and with wealth. And we've reached a point, I believe, in the ascension process where we can no longer avoid or bypass wealth consciousness money and finances. We have to look them in the eye and it is time to learn how to master channeling wealth consciousness. What is wealth consciousness? It is the capacity to attract, receive, hold, and transmit money and financial wealth. And I have to tell you that the way that this has shown up for me, the way that wealth consciousness has shown up for me is that early on, I became, became very good at attracting and receiving wealth. When I started my executive coaching practice back in 2013, and I left my job as a psychologist to do this, I launched my business from, from Paris. You may have heard that story. I launched it from a fourth story walk up in the Marais district with crappy Wi-Fi and it smelled strongly of patchouli, but there I was launching my business. I made my first six figures in six months. And before I left, I had become, not, if not masterful, pretty darn good at calling in high ticket clients, being able to sell high ticket 
anywhere between 3K and 10K to 15K packages before I left. I, I needed to be able to do that before I could leave my corporate position. So I became very good at attracting and receiving where I really was not good is at holding. I was not good at living in the overflow and I was not good at holding on to wealth. I treated money a lot like a hot potato. It came in and it would go out just as fast as it would come in or it would come in and then I would enjoy my life and I would do my things and then it would trickle away. And then I would have to ramp up my business again, put my foot back on the gas and keep going. So I got into a little bit of a feast or famine cycle for a couple of years. Actually, I burned out by 2017. I was, oof, it was, it was a little bit rugged in my business for a while. And my wealth consciousness, while that, er, while the early work I had done around wealth consciousness, learning how to heal my money story and making the transformations that I had already made in terms of being able to attract and receive wealth where I needed support was in worthiness and deservedness on holding on to it and being able to create a vast reservoir within my bank account, within my business, and really within my physical body, within myself to receive all that there was and hold it, all that there was to offer. And now all these years later, I feel like in part, the reason that becoming the channel has come forward now is because I really am ready. I've done my work and I am ready to have conversations with you. I'm ready to invite world-class guests into the podcast who are also channeling wealth consciousness. And by the way, other benevolent beings who are here helping us and to have conversations about what it actually takes to channel wealth consciousness what their experience is with it, what it means to be a channel at all. In fact, I will say one other thing about the impetus for this podcast is that in my last podcast, Mindset Rx, I worked a lot with people who were channels, who were intuitives, but also had ADHD. And in fact, if you have ADHD and you happen to be intuitive, you're in the right place too. So I've still got you covered. Uh, but I had a really important conversation with one of my dear friends, Christina Rice. She has a podcast called Christina the Channel. And we will share that link to our episode in the show notes because you'll want to listen in. She and I early on in that conversation had an exchange about what it means to channel. She's a channel. She channels benevolent beings. She's written a channel. She's co a couple of channel texts, which are quite extraordinary. And you know, it's one of those words that everybody kind of knows what it means, but everybody also has a different definition of it. So I'm going to actually be exploring that. I am, after all, a social scientist, and I am somebody who is always questioning and wondering and wanting to kind of quantify and understand as fully as I can these experiences that we have as human beings and as spiritual beings who are here with a divine mission who are here to anchor light and to usher in the new earth and to create the world that we most want to experience rather than recreating the status quo, which so many of our colleagues happen to be doing. So I think that's it. That's it for today. I am so happy that you're here with us. A couple of things as we're closing for today. One is if you're feeling like you want to have a conversation about working together, because you will, some of you will want to work with me privately, you can start that conversation by scheduling a consult with me. And you do that by going to drrobinmckay.com forward slash call. That takes you to my calendar. You get on the calendar, you fill out an intake form so I can kind of see what's going on with you and see if you're a good fit for working with me privately. If you are, we'll invite you to have the conversation with me to go forward with that. If you're somebody who's just dipping your toes into this space around wealth consciousness and spiritual development and, and how spiritual development relates to business development, I just want to say welcome to you. You'll find a home in, in this arena. You'll find a home here with, with me and with us in, in my community Join the Facebook group if you haven't. Becoming the channel is our Facebook group. We'll have a link to that in the show notes. And 
I just so appreciate you being here. We love you and we will be back next week. We're going to be transmitting every single week. So we will be back next week with another episode. And I can't wait to see what, how this unfolds. Many, many, many blessings until next time.